halfway through the passage here to verse 7. He says, submit yourselves then to God. That's really the main point of this whole passage, so I may as well sit down. No, just kidding. <laughs> submission, submission. Last week we talked a little bit about submission, and I said that in our culture today, a lot of us have a hard time with this idea of submission. Me too. So today I'm preaching to me first, before I preach to you. It's kind of seen as a nasty word these days. And we have such a hard time submitting to each other, submitting to our, in our marriages, submitting to any kind of authority. And we also, of course, have a hard time submitting to God. But submission is just like all the other tests we've looked at so far. Submission is a definite indicator of how strong our faith is. James is saying here that how well we submit shows how real and genuine our faith really is. Do we have a heart of submission? Do we have a spirit of submission? Or do we resist and rebel and put up a fight? And that's why at the beginning of our passage in verse 1, James starts talking about the outward signs of not submitting. The first part of chapter 1, these are the outward signs, real clear indicators that we're not submitting to God. And they are obvious. So he says in verse 1, we're going to start fighting and arguing and having conflict and quarrels with each other if we're not submitting. It's pretty indicative, it's pretty obvious, whether it's in the home or in our marriages or on the job or especially in the church. Verse one says, what is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you or fights and quarrels among you? The obvious answer from James is, we have these outward signs of hostility and conflict, why? because we're not practicing submission. That's the underlying problem. That's the bottom line. Well, the story is told of a dad this one time who heard all this ruckus and all this noise coming from the backyard where his daughter was out there playing with her friends and they were shouting and arguing. And so he went running out to see what was going on and he asked the girls what they were doing and his daughter piped up and said, "Oh." We're just playing church. <laughs> Mark Twain was quoted as saying that he once put a dog and a cat in a cage together as an experiment to see if they could get along together. And after a while, they did. And then he thought, well, maybe I'll do a little more here. So he put a, a bird, a pig, and a goat together in the cage. And sure enough, after a few adjustments, they began to get along too. But then he put a Baptist and a Presbyterian and a Methodist in the cage and nobody survived. <laughs> now, now we laugh at that, but that is so true. We are all prone, me included. So what I'd like us to do now is we're just going to go through the first few verses here and we're going to look at three different kinds of conflict here that James talks about. Uh, that reveal if we have a submissive heart or not. Three different kinds of conflict. Number one, the first kind is obvious, and uh, it's conflict with other people. And that reveals a heart that's not mutually submissive. We need to be mutually submissive. If you look at verse one again, it says, of course, what causes fights and quarrels among you? And look down at verses 11 and 12. He continues it. He says, Brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister. So he's describing what the fights look like, what the quarrels look like. Uh, so, or judges them, speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver and judge the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? 
Now again, I have said this many times in my preaching in the past, this kind of judgment that James is talking about here is not judging between right and wrong or righteousness and sin or good and evil. We're supposed to judge or discern in that way as Christians and especially in the church. We are to make righteous judgments in our own lives and in the church. No, this is talking about interpersonal conflict and slandering someone, tearing someone down, writing them off, declaring them to be an enemy. And there's an analogy here that James uses throughout the passage. That's what he's talking about. We're not to condemn people like that. Only God does that kind of judging, James says in verse 12. There's only one lawgiver and judge. He's the only one who is able to save and destroy, not us. So just to clarify that, and this whole area of conflict is a problem in every relationship. We're all prone. And uh, again, I am not preaching just to you. I'm preaching to me. This is something that can easily happen. And we have these spats and we have these disagreements and feuds and infighting and contention, disruption in every kind of human relationship, but especially among God's people. It's such an indicator of how strong our faith is and how healthy we are as a group of believers. You know, when we think of biblical characters or biblical examples, in the Old Testament, there was Lot who quarreled with Abraham and Sarah had a conflict with Hagar. Moses had countless fights and arguments with the children of Israel. Absalom even fought a war against his own father, King David. And in the New Testament, it wasn't much better. The disciples argued with Jesus over which disciple would be the greatest in his kingdom. And in the book of Acts, Paul and Barnabas had a big disagreement about their little missionary friend, John Mark. And even in churches in the New Testament, they had all sorts of conflict. And the people who come to our Wednesday Bible study know that because we've been looking at the church in Corinth. What were the people in Corinth doing? They were arguing over which faction in the church was better and which leader was better. And then they were suing each other and taking fellow Christians to court. And in Galatia, Paul says that the believers were at one point biting and devouring each other. I, I'm wondering what he really meant, but no, I'm just kidding. He, 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 they were biting and devouring each other. That's pretty strong language. Even in Philippi, which, you know, the letter to the Philippians is the epistle of joy. And yet there were two women having trouble getting along together. And throughout the book of James, James gives us examples of different kinds of fights and quarrels here. In chapter one, he talks about the church as a whole. And he says, we need to be quick to listen and slow to speak. And then in chapter two, he talks about rich people and poor people and different classes in the church not getting along. Then in chapter five, he talks about bosses and employees. So there's all sorts of ways that we can have conflicts with other people. And it's very human and it's so easy to fall into. But we are told in scripture over and over again that for God's people, for the church of God, we have to rise up. We have to seek harmony and togetherness and unity. Here are some verses that go along with that that I found. Psalm 133 verse 1 says, How good and pleasant, pleasant is it when God's people live together in unity. Philippians 2.14 says, Do everything without grumbling or arguing. 2 Timothy 2.14 says, Keep reminding God's people of these things. Warn them before God against quarreling about words. It is of no value and only ruins those who listen. So that's the first kind of conflict that reveals a heart that's not submissive. If we are not submissive to human authority or the people that God has placed over us or to uh, each other, mutual submission, and we are continually having conflict with people, then that shows where our heart's at. It shows that we don't have a heart or a spirit of submission. Then number two, 
The second kind of conflict that reveals whether our heart is submissive or not is conflict within ourselves. And I, I really like this connection here that James gives because that's where the conflict often starts and it spills out to other people. If we don't have peace within ourselves, if we are in turmoil, turmoil ourselves, we're not gonna have peace with other people. If there's conflict and turmoil inside, that's gonna come out with those around us. Look at verses one to three. Halfway through verse one, James talks about where fights and quarrels come from. He says, don't they come from your desires, that battle within you? You desire, but do not have. So you kill, you covet, but you cannot get what you want. So you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. And when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives. Then you may, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. So meaning again, that's in the conflict within ourselves that causes the conflicts in the church and everywhere else. James describes it as your desires that battle within you. He's talking about this spiritual struggle. We all have these sinful desires because of our fallen nature. We are sinners by nature. And what do we desire, James says? Well, he doesn't specify, but he, it's things like power and control and superiority and significance and status and possessions and satisfying our lusts. That's why we fight. That's why we have conflict with other people because the bottom line is we are selfish. We are self-absorbed and self-centered in many ways and we want our own way. We want our own agendas and we want our own desires to be satisfied. And then in verse two, James talks about those selfish desires leading to selfish behavior or leading to selfish action. And he says, you desire, but do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. Maybe not literally kill somebody, but when we kill someone with our words or we crush somebody's spirit, that's like murdering them. Scripture says, 1 John 3.15 says, anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer. You don't have to mow them down with a semi-automatic weapon, but you can kill people, you can crush people. So if we're at war with ourselves, we're gonna be at war with other people. And it's going to come out in our selfish desires, James says. And then it's gonna come out in our actions, hating or coveting or quarreling and fighting. And then he says at the end of verse two, if we're having conflict on the inside and conflict on the outside, that's going to affect, obviously, our prayer life as Christians because we're praying with selfish des uh, motives and selfish desire. So we might be praying, but we have a hidden agenda. So he says at the end of verse two, you do not have because you do not ask and then in verse three, when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong <laughs> motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. That's your agenda. That's your reason for, for praying. So conflict within ourselves is a, another kind of conflict that reveals if we have a submissive heart or not. And then of course, number three, the third kind of conflict is conflict with God. And I honestly believe that if we're not right with people, that means we're not right within ourselves and we're not right with God. Conflict with others is connected with conflict within ourselves and conflict with God. And I've said this, I don't know how many times, when we deal with problems often in the church or in our own lives or in our homes, Oftentimes, the problem or the issue is not really the issue. And we fight over these superficial things way up here, 
And the real issue is not, not even within us. It's our relationship to God. And we aren't being submissive to him. It goes back to what's going on in our hearts. And it ultimately goes back to our relationship with God. That's the root problem, the root issue. If we have a lot of people problems, then we've got a heart problem and a God problem. And conflict with God is the root cause of every other conflict. Whether it's internal or external, it's related to rebellion and resistance and fighting against him. And if we're not right with God, you're not going to be right with yourself. And sure as shooting, you're not going to be right with other people. Look at verses 4 to 6. James says, You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us, but he gives us more grace? That is why scripture says God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. And how do we fight with God? How do we come into conflict with him? James says, when you're friendly with God's enemies, when you start fraternizing, with the enemy. That's how you become an enemy with God. You start becoming friendly with the world. In verse four, he says, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? That's the bottom line. Bible talks about three enemies of God in scripture, the world, the flesh, and the devil. And the first one is what James mentions here, the world. What does that mean? That means any lifestyle or value system or ideology or standard that goes against God. That's out there in our society or in our culture. Anything that is anti-God or anti-Christ, if we embrace that and we celebrate that, then we're being friendly with the world. And that causes enmity and that causes conflict with God. So the world is the first enemy. Then there's the flesh, Scripture says. And that, of course, it's those desires that James talks about in verse 2, those fleshly desires that battle within us. If we give in to them, then they also cause a separation and enmity and conflict with God. And then, of course, there's the devil. He's the third enemy. And his greatest, what's the devil's greatest enemy? tool his greatest temptation is pride it's the original sin and when we fall for pride and we become arrogant and self-sufficient that's when we become friends with the evil one and we become enemies with god that's why james says in verse 6 god opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble so those are the three types of conflict with people with ourselves and with God and they're all connected so what's the answer we're halfway through the passage what's the answer we know what the answer is because we've already looked at it a little bit how do we have peace with people and peace within ourselves and peace with God here's the answer we've come full circle it's submission it is submitting that's the starting point that's the first step James says in verse 7 we've already read it Submit yourselves then to God. That's it. That's how we stop all our conflict. And this literally has the idea of getting into your proper rank. I was hoping that Randy Mitchell would be here because he could relate to this, I'm sure, being from the military. This is the idea of where a rookie private starts acting like a general. That doesn't go over very well. And he's walking around expecting generals and captains and majors to uh, salute to him and pay attention to him. I don't think that would go over very well in the military. You might run into a little bit of static if you did that. What this means is you fall in line 
you surrender to God. You give up the fight. Submission means not my will, but thine be done. And you start looking to the, to the one who is the general over all, and you submit to him. Unconditional surrender, really, this is talking about. It's the only way to peace, really, with God. Peace and victory. And then James says at the end of verse 7, after you submit, the second step, the next thing you do after you submit, what's a part of submitting is resisting the devil. He says, resist the devil because he's behind every conflict that we have, really. And the promise James gives us here, what is the promise of resisting the devil? He will flee from you. This is all military or battleground analogy here. So you stop rebelling, you stop fighting against God, you become friends with him, you surrender to him, then you'll be able to resist. And you'll be able to have victory against temptation, against the devil's attacks. And the third step here in verse 8 is not only to resist, uh, to submit, resist, and then to come near to God. That's how we get our strength. That's how we get our, our power. If we're out there in the battlefield field fighting all alone and we're not going, going back to home base and getting help and support and ammunition, we're going to be in trouble. We have to come near to God. We have to stay near to God. That's how we stay strong. You stay friends with God and not with the enemy. You draw near to him. You pray. You read your word. You fellowship. You come out to church. You meet with other believers. You get into the word. You get encouraged. You get supported. You stay close to God. And James gives us a promise here. If we do that, if we come near to God, guess what? He's going to come near to you. And he's going to be with you. And he's going to comfort us and help us and make his presence known in our lives. But then James explains that when we come near to God, he says here halfway through verse 8 and then verse 9, to make things right with him, we need to wash our hands, he mentions. We're all used to doing that now during the pandemic. We need to do that with God continually as we come near to, to him need to wash our hands, purify our hearts. He even talks about grieving and mourning uh, over our sin. That's talking about repentance. That's how we come near to God. We cleanse our hands. We get our sins forgiven. We ask for forgiveness. We purify our hearts. We become single-minded in our devotion to him. And of course, he's alluding to being double-minded or double-tongued where we say one thing, but we're really doing another thing. We, we uh, think about God, but we're really thinking a lot about the world as well. Being single-minded in our devotion to him. And then the fourth step is, of course, to humble ourselves. Humility. That is the, the basic r response here. In verse 10, James says, Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. And the key phrase here is before the Lord. Not to just to submit outwardly, oh, well, I'm sorry, and I shouldn't have done, done that, to show outward signs of submission, but to actually humble ourselves before God, to bow the knee in our hearts and truly submit. Amen. And the wonderful promise here is he will lift you up. We have this friend, known him for many years, Bob Fife. He came here a few years ago and uh, he uh, preached and he shared his testimony. Uh, he had been in the homosexual lifestyle for many, many years and God saved him and brought him out of that. And he has told me a few times about this verse and he, he has said, Humble yourselves, or humble ourselves before the Lord. Humble yourself before the Lord, 
And he has said to, to me, if you don't humble, humble yourself, God will do it. Mm -hmm. And when he does it, he does a thorough job. Mm -hmm. And my friend Bob is a is living testimony of that. And a wonderful promise, he will lift you up. And again, this is a kind of a battlefield picture. He'll heal your wounds from all the conflict and he'll stop all the bleeding and he'll pick you up off the battlefield and he'll make you spiritually whole and healthy again. So how do we know that our faith is real and genuine and true? It's when we stop having conflict with people and conflict within ourselves and conflict ultimately with God and we surrender and we stop fighting and we submit and we resist the devil. We come near to God and we humble ourselves before the Lord. Amen, amen. and amen. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we continue before you now and we realize that you are an awesome God. We realize that you are the God who sits enthroned above. You are the transcendent one. You are the holy one. You are the God who is in control of all things. And yet you care about us. You love us with an everlasting love. Even before we were born, you set your eyes upon us. And you have a plan and a purpose. And when we move away from that plan and we start doing our own thing and then we get into trouble with getting into conflicts and getting into turmoil within ourselves and with other people, the bottom line is we have to come back to you. We have to submit. Lord, help us to do that right now as individuals and especially as a church. I pray that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit and continually help us to stay near to you. And we know that when we do that, we will be so much better able to resist the devil and to humble ourselves. Lord, may we be a conflict-free zone here in our church because we will be people of submission and that we will be submitting ourselves to you daily and putting our hope and our confidence in you and not in the things of this world. We want to be friends with God. We don't want to be enemies with God. We don't want to be friends of this world that we live in. We want to be near to you. We want to be close to you. Lord, we pray that you would lead and direct us in all things. And just before I close, I've been mainly talking to believers, to the church this morning, but I realize that people might be watching from afar. And I just would give a little invitation. Daryl mentioned about opportunities. We have this opportunity to share the good news of Jesus with those who are watching online. And so if you're watching right now, we pray that the Lord would lead you to him. Lord, we pray that you would draw whoever's watching to yourself and that they would come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and their Savior and you would give them a hope of heaven where they would be able to submit and resist and come near to you and humble themselves. Lord, we thank you for changing us and bringing us, and we know that you can do that with those who are watching. And so we give you this day. We thank you for it. We give you praise in Jesus' precious and most worthy name. Amen, amen. and amen.